सुप्रभात नमस्कार आज हमारे छप्पनवे स्थापना दिवस के उपलक्ष्य पर हम सब यहाँ इकट्ठा हुए हैं मैं आप सभी का अभिनंदन करती हूँ आज के हमारे इस कार्यक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि माननीय डॉक्टर नरेंद्र कुमार त्यागी जी माननीय निदेशक डॉक्टर आर के यादव जी और सी एस एस आर आई के जो भूतपूर्व निदेशक डॉक्टर गुरुबचन सिंह जी डॉक्टर पी सी शर्मा जी और आई आई डब्ल्यू बी आर के निदेशक महोदय डॉक्टर ज्ञानेन्द्र जी और हमारे जितने भी विभागीय अध्यक्ष हैं जितने भी सी एस एस आर आई के भूतपूर्व कर्मचारी गण है मैं देख रही हूँ कि जो रिटायर हो चुके हैं वो भी आज इस अवसर पर पधारे हैं और हमारे जो परियोजना समन्वित हैं एवं मेरे सभी सी एस एस आर आई परिवार के साथियों आप सभी का बहुत बहुत स्वागत है बहुत बहुत अभिनंदन है आज हमारे लिए बहुत ही खुशी का अवसर है किसी भी संस्थान की नींव उसका भविष्य निर्धारित करती है और हम सभी सौभाग्यशाली हैं कि हमें सी एस एस आर आई जैसे अहम संस्थान का हिस्सा बनने का सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ है और इस अवसर पर हम इस संस्थान के जितने भी भूतपूर्व निदेशक रहे हैं जितने भी भूतपूर्व कर्मचारी रहे हैं इन्होंने दिन रात मेहनत करके इस संस्थान को बंजर भूमि जिसको हम जरीफा वीरान बोलते थे आज वो वीरानगी इसमें कहीं नहीं नजर आती है ये बिल्कुल हरा भरा है एक ताजी हवा के साथ है तो उन सब का हम शुक्रिया अदा करते हैं कि इस भूमि पर हरी भरी भूमि पर आज हमने खड़ा होने का अवसर प्रदान किया और उन्हीं भूतपूर्व जो भी हमारे निदेशक रहे हैं महानुभाव रहे हैं उनमें से डॉक्टर एन के त्यागी जी जो कि इस संस्थान के दस साल तक निदेशक रहे आज के कार्यक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि के रूप में हमारे बीच मौजूद है माननीय आपका स्वागत है इस अवसर पर मैं हमारे निदेशक महोदय से अनुरोध करूंगी कि डॉक्टर त्यागी का पुष्प गुच्छ देकर स्वागत करें माननीय निदेशक महोदय से पुनः अनुरोध करूंगी कि वो डॉक्टर गुरबचन सिंह जी का भी पुष्प पुष्प देकर स्वागत करें सर आपका भी आज इस दिन तक आने में बहुत ही अहम योगदान है ये हमारे लिए आदरणीय सूचक है 
मैं निदेशक महोदय से अनुरोध करूंगी डॉक्टर पीसी शर्मा जी का भी पुष्प पुछ लेकर स्वागत करें सर आपसे अनुरोध है कि आप भारतीय गेहूं एवं जो अनुसंधान संस्थान करनाल के निदेशक डॉक्टर ज्ञानेंद्र जी का भी पुष्प गुच्छ देकर स्वागत करें सर आपसे पुनः अनुरोध है कि हमारे आईआरआई के रीजनल स्टेशन के मैं देख रही हूँ डॉक्टर यादव हमारे बीच मौजूद हैं उनका भी पुष्प गुच्छ देकर स्वागत करें आपसे अनुरोध करती हूँ गन्ना प्रजनन संस्थान के मुख्य जो अध्यक्ष हैं डॉक्टर छाबड़ा जी उनका भी पुष्प गुच्छ देकर स्वागत करें बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर पुनः सभी का बहुत बहुत स्वागत है किसी भी शुभ अवसर की शुरुआत हम अपने इष्ट देवताओं के आशीर्वाद से शुरू करते हैं और क्योंकि हमारा ये विद्या का संस्थान है कहेंगे तो माँ सरस्वती के आशीर्वाद के बिना तो कोई भी हमारा कार्यक्रम शुरू नहीं होता है तो मैं मंच पर आसीन हमारे मुख्य अतिथि और निदेशक महोदय और अन्य महानुभावों से अनुरोध करूंगी कि वो दीप प्रज्वलित कर इस कार्यक्रम की शुरुआत करें और मैं डॉक्टर गुरबचन सिंह और डॉक्टर पीसी शर्मा जी और डॉक्टर ज्ञानेन्द्र जी को भी इस पर आमंत्रित करना चाहूंगी कि वो दीप प्रज्वलन में अपना सहयोग दें बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आप सभी का हम सभी भारतीय कृषि अनुसंधान परिषद के सदस्य हैं और सम्मान पूर्वक जो हमारा आईसीआर का गीत बना हुआ है उसे भी सुनकर हम अपने कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाएंगे तो सुनील जी से अनुरोध करती हूँ
जय जय ऋषि परिषद भारत की सुंदर प्रतीक भरित भारत की ऋषि घन पशु धन संरक्षण श्याम भारती की जय जय कृषि प्रदूषण भारत की हेम प्रदेश हर पथ पर आशा स्वागन मंदिर भारत की जय जय कृषि परिषद भारत की जय जय कृषि परिषद भारत की वास्तव में जय जय कृषि परिषद भारत की जिसने हमें अपने देश की सेवा करने का मौका दिया हम सब इस परिषद के शुक्रगुजार हैं कार्यक्रम के शुरुआत के उपलक्ष्य में मैं हमारे माननीय निदेशक महोदय जी से अनुरोध करती हूं उनके स्वागत अभिभाषण के लिए धन्यवाद डॉक्टर अनिता आप सभी को आज इस पावन दिवस केंद्रीय मृदा लवणता अनुसंधान संस्थान करनाल के छप्पनवे स्थापना दिवस और उनतीसवे फाउंडेशन डे लेक्चर सीरीज में आप सभी का मैं स्वागत करता हूं मैं विशेष स्वागत आज के मुख्य अतिथि आदरणीय डॉक्टर एन के त्यागी जी जो आज का फाउंडेशन डे दे, लेक्चर प्रस्तुत करेंगे डॉक्टर गुरबचन सिंह जी आदरणीय मैं ये कहूंगा कि सम्मान जो दिल में है हमारा हमारे पूरे संस्थान के वो हम आभार व्यक्त करना चाहेंगे डॉक्टर ज्ञानेन्द्र जी जो आई के डायरेक्टर हैं हमारे मेरे से पूर्व निदेशक डॉक्टर पी सी शर्मा जी आ, हमारे सीनियर डॉक्टर कामरा साहब डॉक्टर अजोर साहब डॉक्टर दुबे जी छाबड़ा साहब एसबीआई के हेड डॉक्टर आर एन यादव आईआरआई के हेड मंच पर आसीन हमारे चीफ एओ अभिषेक जी डॉक्टर अनीता और संस्थान परिवार के सभी सहयोगियों आप सभी का आज इस कार्यक्रम में मैं हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं आज का ये दिन हमारे लिए विशेष है हम सब के लिए और मैं इस अवसर पे संस्थान के जो संस्थापक निदेशक रहे डॉक्टर भुमला साहब से शुरुआत करके डॉक्टर भुमला साहब डॉक्टर त्यागी साहब डॉक्टर अब्रोल साहब डॉक्टर एन टी सिंह जी उसके बाद डॉक्टर त्यागी साहब डॉक्टर गुरबचन सिंह जी बीच में डॉक्टर अजोर साहब ने काफी देर हमें निर्देशन दिया डॉक्टर डी के शर्मा जी डॉक्टर पी सी शर्मा जी और जो पूर्व के सभी सीनियर्स रहे आज जो उपस्थित हैं उनमें डॉक्टर कामरा साहब डॉक्टर दुबे साहब और जो सीनियर्स जिन्होंने इस संस्थान को इस मुकाम तक लाने में अपना विशेष निर्देशन और सहयोग दिया उसके साथ साथ जो हमारी एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव टेक्निकल और जो स्पोर्टिंग कैटेगरी रही उनका जो योगदान रहा है वो विशेषतया मैं आज उनके प्रति आभार और सम्मान व्यक्त करता हूं और ये अवसर है 
कि हम अपना अपनी कृतज्ञता आभार रिस्पेक्ट कोई भी नाम दो लेकिन आज का दिन ये है कि मैं अपनी ओर से और आज जो स्टाफ है उन सब की ओर से कृतज्ञता प्रकट करता हूं प्रस्तुत करता हूं कि आज जो संस्थान है जिस मुकाम पे है उसके पीछे हमारे सभी पुराने सहयोगी चाहे वो संस्थान में किसी भी रूप में रहे उनका जो एक विशेष योगदान है उसी की वजह से आज हम आगे के बारे में सोचने की स्थिति में हैं। डॉक्टर गुरुबचन सिंह जी की कई बातें याद आती हैं कि इस संस्थान की मिट्टी में ही कुछ ऐसा है कि अगर हम थोड़ा कुछ भी करते हैं तो ये उसके बदले में हमें विशेष और बहुत ज्यादा देती है व्यक्तिगत प्रोग्रेस के तौर पे पूरे परिवार की प्रगति के तौर पे तो मैं इस मिट्टी को इस संस्थान को आज नमन करता हूं और मैं अपने सभी पूर्व के निदेशक जो पूर्व में जिन्होंने इस संस्थान के लिए अपना पसीना बहाया है अपनी मेहनत दी है उन सब को आज इस स्टाफ की तरफ से एक एक आश्वासन भी देना चाहता हूं कि हमें आपकी डायरेक्शन और मार्गदर्शन मिलेगा तो हम कोशिश सर हम भरसक कोशिश करेंगे कि हम संस्थान को आ, कुछ आगे ले जाने की चाहे जितना भी हम पूरी अपनी क्षमता से एफर्ट्स करेंगे कि संस्थान की के, को जो दायित्व मिला है उस दायित्व में हम चाहे वो वैज्ञानिक प्रगति है चाहे हम किसानों की सेवा के लिए कुछ कर पाए उसमें प्रगति की बात है उसी तरह सोसाइटी के प्रति अगर जो दायित्व है और देश के प्रति जो दायित्व है उसको हम अपनी पूरी कोशिश से आप सबके मार्गदर्शन में आगे ले जाने की कोशिश करेंगे सो so, आज मैं अपनी ओर से संस्थान की ओर से अपने सभी जो आए हुए सीनियर्स हैं और सभी मेरे सहयोगी हैं उन सब का स्वागत करता हूं, धन्यवाद करता हूं और आप सबको छप्पनवे स्थापना दिवस की बहुत बहुत शुभकामनाएं देता हूं, धन्यवाद बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर अभी सर के ही अभिभाषण से हमें पता चला कि डॉक्टर राम हजूरी भी हमारे बीच में मौजूद हैं सर माफी चाहते हैं क्योंकि हम लोग आपको पहचानते नहीं है नाम जरूर सुना है हमने तो हमारे निदेशक महोदय से अनुरोध करूंगी कि आपका भी कुछ कुछ देकर स्वागत करें धन्यवाद सर आज के दिन का हमारे संस्थान के जितने भी वैज्ञानिक और हर वर्ग के जितने भी कर्मचारी गण हैं उनको भी विशेष तौर से इस दिन का इंतजार रहता है क्योंकि सभी को अपने अपने वर्ग में सर्वश्रेष्ठ कर्मचारी का पुरस्कार जो मिलना होता है और मुझे उम्मीद है कि जितने भी प्रतिभागी हैं वो सब यहाँ मौजूद होंगे और उनको उम्मीद होगी कि हाँ इस साल तो मेरा ही नंबर होगा मुझे भी मिलेगा इस साल का तो सर्वश्रेष्ठ कर्मचारी ही जो है हमारे प्रशासनिक वर्ग में तकनीकी वर्ग में और कुशल सहाय कर्मचारी के वर्ग में है और इसके विवरण के लिए मैं डॉक्टर राजकुमार को आमंत्रित करती हूँ वो इसका ब्यौरा देंगे
धन्यवाद मैडम आज के कार्य विक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि आदरणीय डॉक्टर एन के त्यागी सर संस्थान के निदेशक महोदय डॉक्टर आर के यादव सर सी एस के सभी भूतपूर्व निदेशक गहम एवं जवाहर संस्थान के निदेशक अन्य संस्थान संस्थान से आए अतिथिगण सी एस के सभी से, सेवानिवृत्त कर्मचारी तथा संस्थान के सभी कर्मचारियों को मेरा नमस्कार जैसा कि हमें सभी सभी को यहाँ है कि आ, हमारे सी एस इंस्टीट्यूट को आई के द्वारा दो बार बेस्ट इंस्टीट्यूट अवार्ड का अवार्ड मिला गया है वो है 1998 में और 2009 में और जो उस अवार्ड की जो वैल्यू थी अवार्ड वैल्यू जो मनी होती है उसके जो भी इंटरेस्ट बनता है उस मनी का जो है साइंटिफिक टेक्निकल एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव और स्पोर्टिंग स्टाफ कैटेगरी के लिए एक एक अवार्ड जो है उसके लिए रखा गया था रखा जाता है हर साल तो इस साल हमने चारों अवार्डो के लिए अप्लीकेशन इन्वाइट किए थे हमारे साइंटिफिक कैटेगरी के लिए जो अवार्ड है वो सी एस आर एक्सीलेंसी अवार्ड है उसमें इस बार हमारी आर की मीटिंग कंडक्ट नहीं हो पाई क्योंकि हमारे चेयरमैन साहब विदेश में हैं इस बार से मीटिंग कंडक्ट नहीं हो पाई जो आर एस मेम्बरीज का इवेल्यूशन करते हैं तो आने वाले समय में हमें अगले महीने तक आर की मीटिंग हो जाएगी उसी में सी एस एक्सीलेंस अवार्ड की इवेल्यूशन हो जाएगी और अवार्ड फाइनल होगा बाकी एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव कैटेगरी में हमने जो एप्लीकेशन इनवाइट किए थे उसमें हमें सिर्फ एक ही एप्लीकेशन इस बार प्राप्त हुई थी तो उसमें जो एप्लीकेशन प्राप्त हुई थी जो भी स्कोर था उसमें वो स्कोर जो भी हमने एक मिनिमम क्राइटेरिया रखा था उसमें वो पा गए थे उसमें स्कोर पा लिया था तो जो इस बार का एडमिनिस्ट्रेटिव कैटेगरी में जो अवार्ड मिल रहा है वो है श्री गुरशरण जी को तो मैं गुरशरण जी से अनुरोध करता हूँ कि स्टेज पर हमें अपनी अवार्ड ले जाए मैं अपने मुख्य अतिथि एवं निदेशक महोदय से भी अनुरोध करता हूँ कि हमारे जो अवार्ड विनर हैं श्री गुरुचरण सिंह जी वो अवार्ड प्रस्तुत करें इसके अलावा हमारी टेक्निकल कैटेगरी में हमें तीन एप्लीकेशन प्राप्त हुए थे तो तीन तीन एप्लीकेशन में इसमें टाई हुआ था हमारे दो इंप्लाइंग का स्कोर ऑलमोस्ट टाई हो गया था तो उसमें से श्री दिलबाग सिंह जी और श्री करतार सिंह जी का जिनको मैं निमंत्रण करता हूँ कि किस स्टेज पर आए और अपना अवार्ड ले जाए चौथी कैटेगरी हमारी स्किल्स प्रोटीन स्टाफ की उसमें हमें इस साल किसी का भी कोई एप्लीकेशन प्राप्त नहीं हुआ तो हम कोई भी कैंडिडेट नहीं हुई जी जी इसमें सर जो अवार्ड वैल्यू है वो तीन हजार रुपये है इसमें तो जो शेयर हुआ है दिलबाग जी और करता जी को फिफ्टी फिफ्टी मिलेगा धन्यवाद सर धन्यवाद डॉक्टर राजकुमार और बड़ी ही हैरानी की बात है कि कुशल सहायक कर्मचारी के वर्ग में कोई भी प्रतिभागी नहीं है 
ऐसा लगता है कि सभी अपना अपना सर्वश्रेष्ठ दे रहे हैं और किसी को भी और पुरस्कार मिलना <laughs> कार्यक्रम को कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाते हुए मुझे लगता है मेरी आवाज कब तक आ रही है शुक्रिया होगा सर हमारा जो ये बिजली का है ये आई थिंक जनरेटर पे कनेक्ट होता है वो दो चार मिनट में आ जाती है यस थैंक यू जैसा कि हमारे निदेशक महोदय ने बताया था कि वैसे तो आज हमारा छप्पनवा फाउंडेशन डे है लेकिन जो फाउंडेशन डे लेक्चर शुरू हुआ था वो उनतीस मई ट्वेंटी नाइन्थ टू डे इन द लेक्चर सीरीज एंड वी हैव डॉक्टर एन के त्यागी जी विदास as the chief guest to deliver his foundation day lecture so before he starts his uh, presentation or his views i would like to uh, briefly recite his achievements although we all know very well about him his work and his professional and uh, research achievements uh, he was born on uh, 12th january 1947 in the family of farmer in ismailapur bijnor uttar pradesh and uh, as we all know that he was the former director of uh, central soil cell entity research institute karnal and sir was also member of agriculture scientists recruitment board and uh, i hope a uh, few of the scientists would be here who have been selected by uh, our chief guest dr tyagi ji so do that the lucky guys many okay. would be there okay <laughs> uh he graduated in agricultural engineering from uh, gb pant university pantnagar in 1967 and then he obtained a masters degree in soil and water conservation engineering from iit kharagpur followed by phd in civil engineering in uh, 1984 he had also a post doctoral research fellowship uh, from usc logan usa and his professional career has spanned for more than 3 decades mainly his work in land and water management and the improvement of uh, soils and land and uh, his uh, attainments were uh, in the form of uh, director and member asrb after uh, completing his successful scientific career as a scientist and uh, he had provided uh, technical and policy support for large scale implementation of land rehabilitation programs and the list is very long and sir has asked me to be very brief about that and uh, his peer recognition we can identify that he has been associated with the number of water related programs which were launched by international agencies like icid iptrid and fao also and uh, he was the indian team leader of the european union supported program on policies for water saving in yellow river basin a dsa supplied to nixia and shendor in china and there were four institutes from europe two from china and one from cssri india so he was the representative in that program he had also worked as the indian coordinator of the dfid support project and then he organized various uh, rlc basin countries to develop so many collaborative programs <laughs> and uh, his research recognition can be identified in terms of so many awards and medals he had jawaharlal nehru award for outstanding doctoral research he was a recipient of rafi ahmed kidwai award icr during 96 and he was also a recipient of isae gold medal for lifetime outstanding achievements in agricultural engineering he is also a fellow of uh, several academics and societies like nos fellow inae and so many others so he has given his uh, consultancy uh, expertise at the national salinity research center iram in addition to the uh, european union also in uh, various uh, international collaborative programs so sir i invite you for uh, your uh, ideas i would say because jo sir ke uh, talk ka uh, vishay hai maine usko hindi mein likha hai 
कि बदलते जलवायु परिवेश एवं लुप्त होते प्राकृतिक संसाधनों के मध्य निरंतर खाद्य सुरक्षा बनाए रखने का कैसे एक मानचित्र हमें बनाना है दी रोड मैप आई वेलकम यू सर सस्टेन डायरेक्टर सी एस पाई डॉक्टर यादव फॉर्मर डायरेक्टर डॉक्टर शर्मा आई थिंक गुरुबज सिंह हजारी गांव and i have to see in the galaxy distress uh dr gajendra singh dr yadav dr kamra and my old friends uh, dr kevil ramani mr everybody who comes to institute becomes a director <laughs> a doctor uh, dr ramajro dr dubey and many other friends uh, dr chabra thank you very much for inviting me and i'm grateful to all of you uh, particularly dr anil saman for the very generous introduction i'm also saying in the audience all my old friends and uh, fellow scientists technical officers administrative officers on on the dais uh, our present chief administrative officer dr rana mr rana ladies and gentlemen i am extremely happy to be here my greetings to all of you at the outset i wish you all very warm heartfelt congratulations on the foundation celebrations I feel very privileged for being invited to deliver this foundation lecture on the 56th foundation day of this institute. I want to amend. I, I think it has already been amended, but since uh, I had written it like that, uh, we had had 28 foundation day lectures so far. This is the 29th one, and I very vividly remember that. Uh, we organized the first foundation day lecture in 1995 with dr vil chopra as the chief guest that time he has demoted the office of the director general because by that time dr prabhu has joined now this lecture series has become a regular feature and that makes me glad we initiated the same tradition Uh, in SRB, after my joining there, to uh, turn uh, five, uh, I don't know whether this is being continued there or not. The other tradition we started at CSRI was institution of best sanitary worker award for the scientist and the best worker award for three other categories out of the interest money as I earlier told, or the out of the savings or interest that we got. Uh, out for that award i am very happy that both these traditions are being continued <clears throat> being among the scientists to possess a non advanced understanding of science and in agriculture especially biostatistics and agriculture where millions of popular people who supposedly work on the barren land to make both and they meet it is an honor the former vice president of the world bank dr saragul din was once visiting our institute and i was accompanying him when i was briefing him about the institute activities and its high two programs i happened to tell him that we had a regional station for research on salt affected soil in bhati source he immediately interjected and had and told has anybody ever successfully reclaimed what uh, souls so my response was that our goal was to help people the people who own that land some of whom 
had to rely for their livelihood on that land alone. So our focus is on people and uh, land is a means of supporting them. In exchange for all the labor, hard labor of love, Mother Earth gets moon and showers a bounty on the hardworking laborers, hardworking farmers, and that is how they are <coughs> making their living out of that water source. Friends, since its founding in 1969, I have been a regular visitor. I have seen it growing as a prospective assistant engineer during I was a candidate in uh, 1970. I visited Jarnali Koti for the first time. Uh, the waiting list was very long. And by the time I got the offer, I had already joined a senior position. But in 1970, I could not come here. It was uh, for the next uh, two years, there was a ban on uh, recruitment. Uh, so I could make it to CSRI only in 1975. Since then, I uh, continuously have been here. Even after I left, I have maintained contact with you. After being in operation for almost 60 years, CSRI has gone through multiple transformational uh, changes. I recall Dr. Bhumla, the founder director, once commenting on the brief existence of high achieving situation in India. He said, India is a tropical country and in tropical climate, things deteriorate very fast. I'm glad. And he said, the research institutions are no exceptions to this uh, law, to this rule. I'm glad to see that CSRI is still a shining star. And I want to thank each and every one of you for maintaining the high bar and pay <clears throat> as a former member of the CSRI family, I take pleasure in its reflected splendor and pay homage to my former research leaders and dedicated band of scientists for their vision and foresight. So this is what I say is my way of uh, the celebration of the foundation lecture. And now I come to uh, the job that is assigned to me. And, and I am speaking on road map for sustainable 2050 from the food future, from its depleting natural resources and mounting climate change. This has already been translated by you in, in the, uh, okay. <clears throat> I'll take around uh, uh, 30 to 35 minutes. And this lecture, why I chose this topic, I could have spoken on sanity management on which uh, uh, all of you and I have been working for quite a time. But nowadays, wherever you go, there is talk of food security and how this food security is going to be impacted due to climate change, due to decline in natural resources. As a matter of fact, the National Academy of uh, Agriculture Sciences, they have assigned job to a select band of people to develop a roadmap for uh, 2047. They call it roadmap for ICR during the Amrit Kal. So it's, since uh, I, had a small assignment on that topic. I thought probably uh, the roadmap that I will present there, uh, let me practice here. <laughs> so this is out of that, that uh, I have uh, chosen this topic for uh, delivering lecture here. <laughs> this will cover ecology laws, biocapacity, and ecological footprint. This, this will take around five minutes. Then the poultry resource boundaries as impacted by climate change and agriculture sector. The third issue that I will talk is projected food, land, and greenhouse gas mitigation and gaps. This uh, globally, uh, the developments are taking place. 
and as a result of those development certain progress is being made but still there is a gap gap in terms of mitigation of the uh, greenhouse gases that are produced there are gaps in terms of the food requirement that is projected to be uh, required in 2047 and further there are gaps in terms of the area that we require under forestation so that our uh, climate balance is maintained <clears throat> then i'll briefly speak about harnessing the emerging science because this is only through the new science that we will be able to survive and uh, remain food water and energy secure then technology alone does not help unless it is mainstreamed in the development policies and therefore the last section of my lecture will be the policy uh, framework that is required to translate uh, and uh, adopt these technologies emerging technology the existing technologies so that the development objectives are achieved <clears throat> you see this uh, Do you see this is small where where it is being projected here? This uh, this is a cartoon. Hmm. This says it's trying it's trying to see where is the enemy, which is who is creating all these disturbances. on the planet and finally when he analyzes he finds that the enemy is human being itself uh, this is a very famous book closing the circle by commoner read in 1971 and he has propounded four laws of ecology it is because of the ecological imbalance that the natural resources are getting degraded and depleted so the first law of ecology is everything is connected to every other things ecological system is an amplifier a small perturbation in one place may have a large dist and distant and long delayed effect elsewhere you see uh, the icebergs are melting uh, in a distant place but you are finding the back in terms of floods in terms of cyclones and europe which used to be a cold continent uh, you find uh, heat waves you find floods whole of uh, china and usa they are facing uh, flood threats why it is it is because in the past we have drastically changed the environment and because of that the uh, at that time uh, those disturbances were not foreseen but now we are seeing the effect the second law is everything must go somewhere so uh, the famous law is law matter cannot be destroyed it can ch change its shape so this is the second law of thermodynamics uh, in nature there is no final waste Uh, it gets uh, converted into uh, something else but it remains on the uh, planet the third law is the nature knows best so if you make any disturbance in the natural system it is likely to have some detrimental effect all development activities they will disturb nature see there are the two kinds of environments natural environment and built environment this building is a built environment river is a natural system but canal is a built uh, infrastructure so all built infra infrastructure all built uh, any anything uh, what, uh, th that comes through development they disturb nature we have to see how many are the benefits and what are the trade offs 
So there is uh, the four classes. There, there is no such thing as free lunch. If you exploit nature, there will always be a, an ecological cost. You have to see whether the ecological cost is more than the benefit I'm receiving. So that is the principle of the uh, sustainable development. No matter what you do, there will always be some uh, disturbance. There will always be some ecological imbalance. But we have to see whether the benefits that we are receiving are more than what the damage is being caused. I introduced to you, you may already be knowing, three terms. Ecological footprints and biocapacity. The ecological footprint measures the human demand on natural capital. What is the natural capital? The quantity of nature that is required that in terms of crop, land, grassland, forest, and sea that is required to support the people and the economies in terms of consumption and assimilation of waste. See, when uh, we to produce food, we use, we use some land. When we wear clothes, it requires some land to produce fibers. <clears throat> uh, when we make houses, uh, you need this wood from the forest. These are all called natural capital. Now, we are producing a lot of waste, and there is some space required for digesting and assimilating this so this is this requirement is calculated in terms of the ecological footprint and the major for ecological footprint is the global factor uh, when the table comes you will be able to appreciate this better then secondly the biocapacity and biocapacity it represents the productivity of its ecological assets what are the ecological assets cropland grazing land, forest land, fishing grounds, and belt of lands. These are the natural uh, capitals, and these resources are utilized to produce things that we need for our food, our feed, our fodder, uh, and uh, our houses. So the, the capacity is limited. Each area has got certain biocapacity. Only the productive land, biologically productive land, contributes to the biocapacity. Now, what are the global hectare? It is a measurement unit for the ecological footprint of people or activities and the biocapacity of the earth, or it is varying from region to region. One global hectare is the world annual amount of biological production for human use and human waste and assimilation. Can you look this table carefully? On top, I have put India at, at today's level of population and present level of consumption and waste. The ecological footprint in India is 1.19 global hectare. But our capacity of our land in India, for the present population is only 0.43 global hectare. So naturally, if your capacity is less and your uh, footprint is high, there is a deficit. So there is a deficit of 0.76 hectare per person per year. It means we are living on borrowed capital somewhere. Whether it, it is in terms of the degradation of a lens, whether it is the, the, uh, lowering the water table, or whether it is the depletion of oxygen in, in atmosphere. So all this is deficit. Our biocapsid deficit in India is of the order of 1,000 million global hectare. At present uh, level of population, we can, we are having this uh, 
deficit 0.76. The <coughs> uh, measuring our product land productivity and other available resources at present, if we want to remove this deficit, we can maintain only a population of 48 crores. But we are now uh, close to 142 crores. That is why this deficit is reflected uh, here. In USA, they are consuming about eight times of what we are consuming. Their uh, bio capacity is 3.35. They also have a deficit, <clears throat> but their deficit is much smaller than us. Canada, they are a surplus area. That is why population people are from all around the world are migrating to Canada. <laughs> their population is less, their, their uh, bio capacity is more. China is uh, at the same level as a matter of China has a higher deficit than we. Because our land productivity, uh, we have not realized it, but our land and water sources, uh, we are richer than uh, China. That is why their biocapacity deficit is uh, uh, about four times of what we have. Brazil is another country which has surplus uh, biocapacity. If you see globally, ecological footprint, we are about half of the global footprint. Biocapacity of the world is 1.63 per person. There is a deficit. Uh, uh, if you add for all the countries, about 10,000 million. Uh, so this is the situation why our land and water resources are getting degraded because our biocapacity is less, though our consumption is, is still very low as compared, uh, it is much lower than the world average. But because of the large population, uh, it is uh, creating problems. This food sector impacts resource boundaries and climate change. Now in agriculture, the food sector seems to be at odd with the increasing global drive. The whole world is talking of the sustainable development goal, millennium development could not be achieved, but now uh, a new target in terms of sustainable goals has been fixed. Uh, but in agriculture, because of the uh, type of development that is that is taking place, the impact of agriculture on several planetary resource boundaries, particularly nitrogen, phosphorus flows, loss of biodiversity, water consumption, and greenhouse gas emission, they are impacting uh, this sustainable development. If we want to have a sustainable future, we have to develop a system in which planet on which we are living remains healthy. The current food system of production and consumption is outstripping the natural sources boundaries and we urgently need to evolve a solution for healthy diet. There are problems on the demand side. There are problems on the consumption side. On the demand side, we have to have some dietary adjustment. On the demand side, I was recently working for uh, this uh, paper on food losses. And uh, I tried to estimate how much uh, the resources we are uh, reducing, the how and resources we are degrading because of the food losses that are taking place. According to estimate that I could make, there are about 75 billion cubic meter to 100 billion cubic meter water that is lost in the um, food loss, which um, water is embedded in the food. Water is embedded in the uh, food. And it means to produce food, you require water. When you lose, when you whether waste food or it is lost food, it wastes water. The estimates, uh, pars it is, of course, it is a partial uh, uh, estimate. 75 to 100 billion 
cubic meter water is lost in the food loss. It is not only the water that is lost. Our estimates show that about 50 million hectare land on which this lost food is grown is also wasted. Then in terms of energy, there was a uh, 40 uh, gigawatt uh, energy that was embedded in the food loss that took place. So adjustment in diets, that is through demand management, and use of technology in increasing the production efficiency are the way out, as we will see later. <clears throat> When we talk of climate change in agriculture, it has got a two-way relationship. When you are in industry, there is no photosynthesis. So you are all, always emitting the uh, greenhouse gases. In agriculture, because in photosynthesis, a carbon dioxide is uh, used for uh, with water for generating uh, food for the plant. 40 percent, uh, 25 percent of total emissions that are generated for the globe are consumed by the plant through photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. If there no in no other industry, uh, photosynthesis or the uh, emission uh, take place. 125 percent is uh, absorbed by the sea. If uh, sea becomes uh, acidic then its capacity to absorb this carbon dioxide will be reduced. So, but in agriculture, it is, it is <clears throat> releasing carbon dioxide, but also it is consuming carbon dioxide in the photosynthesis. So it has got a two-way relationship, we call it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, you must have many of many of the scientists must have come across this planetary resource boundaries, this concept uh, <clears throat> given by Stockholm Environment Institute. It says like a line uh, in Indian mythology, we have nine planets, no grand. So in science also, we have nine planetary boundaries. And these two planetary boundaries are climate, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, growth, uh, fresh water use, ocean acidification, biodiversity, land use change, like that, there are nine parameters. Let's see what is the situation of these uh, global uh, planetary boundaries. In atmosphere, two indicators of climate change are there. One is the carbon dioxide and ppm. Another is the radiative forces. The limit for carbon dioxide was 350 ppm per minute. We have reached 417. So this boundary of in terms of carbon dioxide has been breached. Carbon dioxide is just a representative for the total greenhouse gas equivalent. Then the radiative forces have become almost 2.7 times, times. That is why this temperature is rising, because whatever energy is coming from the sun, it's being absorbed, not being reflected. And because of that, uh, the uh, absorption of the sun radiation is about 2.72. Watt per meter square. Nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen removed from atmosphere. The limit is 35 million tons per year. We are removing 121. So far as phosphorus flow is concerned, the limit is 11. We are almost reaching that boundary soon. This will be creating a, a problem. Global freshwater consumption. The boundary limit is 4 
thousand kilo cubic kilometer per year. We have almost reached there in uh, 2014. Uh, after 2014, uh, the fresh estimates are not available. But we were almost breaching the fresh water boundary limit in uh, 2014. Ocean acid acidification, 2.72 argon is the limit. Argon is the measure of the calcium, calcium carbonate of calcium type. We have breached this. Land use change. It is required that we should have, uh, we should not in, have more than 15% land under crops. We have always, almost reached there, 12% uh, of the total global area. And if, you, if you convert uh, forest land or grassland to crop land, then huge difference in the greenhouse gas emission takes place. Global water energy and food security challenge. As is expected that there may be 10 billion people by that time. So, uh, they will require 60% more food. Uh, you see this red color, this is the population projected population of India. And we will require about 40% more food. At global level, 60% more food will be required. More water, 50% more water. Uh, for India, the water requirement may be 50% uh, uh, more than the existing level. Energy, global energy use will change by 80%, but in India, it will be more than double because at present, our energy use uh, per person is low. So there are three types of gaps I was mentioning have been identified. And these gaps have to be full, fulfilled if we want to sustainably feed 10 billion people by 2050. Uh, <clears throat> this study is by Rang Nathan, published in 2018. They say that at global level, at the present level of productivity, there will be 50% food gap. This food gap is to be filled through technology development. Then there is a land gap. Land gap, it says, we have converted more area under crops. We have got more in the crops. And at global level, this extra conversion of forest land into crop land is of the order of around 600 million hectares. In India, uh, we are required to put 33% area under forest. At present, probably we have reached 20, 21% area. So this is a land gap. Uh, we have to reconvert forest land, uh, with crop land to the forest land. This is called land gap. The other, the other one was food gap. So there is a food gap, there is a land gap, and then there is a mitigation gap. Mitigation gap at global level, we require to mitigate 11 gigatons of greenhouse gases, which we have produced more. This has to be sequestered. If we, the, the rate at which we are undertaking the mitigation measures, there remains a, this much gap. This is a huge gap. Gigaton is a big uh, unit. If this is not met, your global temperature will rise by two degrees. India's agriculture emission at present is 19%. It has to be reduced to 30%, which is the global average. And our industrial development has lagged. More greenhouse gases emission will likely to take place because as we grow industrially, so in future, our development activities have to be uh, what you call zero emission or zero carbon. You know, this is what is called. 
there is a five course menu of solutions for sustainable food system. The first is that reduce growth in demand for food and other agriculture products. How we can reduce? There are two ways. Population reduction is not a feasible uh, option in near future. It will take some time to stabilize or come down. The first option is that you have to adjust the diet to, to uh, match with the ecology, biological bio capacity of our production system. So come down, uh, use uh, more vegetarian food, which has a lower uh, greenhouse gas emission or uh, footprint, carbon footprint. The other is that you reduce food waste. Uh, food waste uh, is uh, getting attention globally now. Uh, and uh, they have said that if we reduce food by, uh, waste by 50%, uh, uh, by say 2050, you, you cannot eliminate food uh, loss or food waste, but you can definitely try to reduce this. A lot of uh, development in food processing, storage, transportation, what they call in terms of economics, they call value chain. A lot of development in value chain is taking place. And maybe uh, in future, the food losses will be reduced. But I find the food wastes are in, uh, increasing, uh, particularly uh, um, when uh, large and uh, you can say like fat marriage celebrations take place, <laughs> big conferences are organized. There are a lot of uh, food waste. Energy consumption in the post-production phase is much more, much more than in the production phase. So when you waste food at the table, it has got a higher water and energy footprint as compared to the production phase. So uh, by uh, this is another approach which will be required to be adopted. Then the protect and restore natural ecosystem and limit agriculture land shifting. Don't shift land from a, uh, forest to uh, cropland and restore natural ecosystem balance. Our land reclamation program is a step in that uh, direction. Yesterday when we were discussing our uh, projects, uh, we were talking about the ecosystem services. So agriculture is the probably only nature-based industry which uses carbon and water to develop food. It is the only enterprise uh, on the globe which has got a capacity to provide ecosystem services. So I you know, next, uh, sometime uh, propagate this as uh, land reclamation is a natural process by which we are contributing to ecosystem uh, services to, to bring uh, the mother heart uh, move from destruction to uh, creation. Increase in the fish supply. Uh, in recent years, uh, some developments, uh, I think uh, in Haryana also, earlier uh, fish were not grown. Now, probably this is increasing. When I was there, I could see that there is a butter land where you uh, depress the uh, soil, uh, land. A lot of uh, fish production was taking place. More, <clears throat> and uh, in subsequent slides, you will see there is a lot of scope for uh, increase in fish supply. Then reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture production. Uh, we have a lot of technical uh, scientific program under which uh, uh, zero uh, energy uh, emission, zero carbon. Uh, Agriculture, but it's a, there's a uh, program for that, and it has to increase. The government is introducing these. Ice. You can you can see a lot of these solar panels. This is this is a, a part in that di direction. But in agriculture, uh, adoption through it was a poor cousin of climate change planners. Uh, earlier at uh, this uh, uh, convention, uh, uh, 
less talk was on, ad on adoption, but more talk of mitigation. But in agriculture, it is the adaptation and adaptation led mitigation that has higher uh, capacity. <laughs> <clears throat> the impact of rising greenhouse gases under climate change is addressed through two distinct and complementary processes, mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation addresses the cause of climate change, whereas adaptation that addresses the effect of uh, climate change. In agriculture, opportunities for adaptation which connotes adjustment to moderate the impact of climate change are higher. Enhancement of agricultural productivity without putting excessive additional greenhouse gas into the atmosphere is one of the key for adaptation like mitigation. Uh, about uh, five years back, we analyzed what has been the impact of greenhouse gas, uh, what has been the impact of green revolution on adaptation and mitigation. So from 1990 to 2010, uh, that, uh, I, that work I did with uh, IFRI, we took 1990 as the base when greenhouse, uh, this uh, green revolution technology has stabilized. And we tried to work out how much has been the uh, increase in productivity, how much has been the reduction in carbon footprint per ton of milk production. How much has been the reduction in carbon uh, this, uh, water footprint and carbon for both? We found that though green revolution technologies of increased fertilizer application, increased irrigation, and improved seed, they did not have the objective of reducing green uh, means climate change. But had this, this development not taken place, India would have required 55 million hectare additional area to feed the people if the productivity had remained at the level of 1990. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, mitigation, there was no direct mitigation, but there was virtual mitigation because if you are putting additional land under cultivation, uh, the difference between the emission from the cropland and the forest land that would have taken place. So we found that about 86% was the mitigation led adaptation. Uh, this report is uh, published in a free document. Uh, sometime when I come next time, I can. I have a. We have a written uh, book on that. So I'll try and pass on to the library. Okay. There are complexities of our adaptation in agriculture and food sector. Agriculture food systems are multidimensional. There are biophysical systems, economic systems, social systems, and institutional. Is all these Subsystems are part of agriculture. Agriculture is not only food production. Uh, how society develops, how our cultural uh, behavior changes, all these are part of agriculture. And adaptation of them for one sector. Because of the interconnection, I said the first law of ecology is you cannot do anything singly. So it will have effect on the other, other sector. So agriculture, well, whatever disturbances, whatever development you do, it affects the water sector, it affects the energy sector, it affects the energy uh, industry sector. So all these are interconnected. And the policies that are framed for other sector impacts agriculture sector. Further, impacts are region specific. Uh, if a fair is here, it is working here, it will not work in Tamil Nadu with the almost same efficiency. But a crop which is doing well here will not uh, do uh, work with the same efficiency in Tamil Nadu. Therefore, uh, impacts on agriculture are region-specific. 
not only region specific, different crops are impacted differently. That is why you say this is heat tolerant, this is water tolerant. So a batch of crop is specific. Then adaptations to some extent are farmer specific. Why? Because the capacity, the capacity to execute a particular intervention in his field varies from person to person. Therefore, it is very complex. That is why there is a long gap with the development of a technology and its implementation on the large scale. So in agriculture, adaptation is the, the prominent or most uh, you, you should uh, uh, mechanism for uh, you can say reducing the climate change changes, but it is complicated because of the regional variations, because of the crop specific variations, because of the person to person variations. <laughs> Therefore, one size fits all uh, will not work. It is not feasible. A basket of options need to be done. As a matter of fact, globally, they have established a forum, what they call Adaptation Future. Uh, it was established in 2010, and in, 19, and in 2021, the uh, conference on Adaptation Future was held in New Delhi. Adaptation including incremental and transformation changes. Technical options. New crops and varieties with which uh, you, you are all familiar with, efficient irrigation water, water saving technologies, conservation agriculture. These are uh, options here. Ecosystem based options, soil conservation, afforestation, reforestation, mangrove conservation, etc. Economic options. Hai. Financial incentives, insurance, payment for ecosystem services, pricing of water, cash transfers. This is already the government is doing. Laws and regulations, land zoning, water regulations, defined property rights. Economist says that uh, uh, productivity is low because there are no secure tenancy uh, rights. And uh, Though the state government, I remember uh, this uh, Rajasthan about 20 years back, they the, uh, passed the groundwater extraction, uh, groundwater regulation law, but it never uh, was implemented. And that is why there is problem uh, uh, all over India, more so in Punjab and Haryana, some to some part of West Uttar Pradesh, where declining water table is taking place because there are no effective regulations. National and uh, government policies. So national policies, uh, plants including mainstreaming of adaptation plants, integrated coastal zone land plan areas. These are the various uh, technological, ecosystem based, and economic options for which uh, we can uh, uh, adopt or we can uh, follow this adapted land mitigation. This uh, picture only shows whatever in the field is being done uh, laser learning, uh, zero tillage. Uh, micro irrigation. As a matter of fact, the adaptation of the technologies options uh, vary from state to state. We did a study for two states, Haryana and Bihar. And our finding was there were no takers for Sierra SRI technology in Haryana. It was uh, adopted in Bihar. Whereas land leveling was uh, first preference in Haryana and uh, to some extent in uh, Bihar also. Zero tillage, uh, this is a very popular technology. Uh, it is going everywhere. So uh, there was a difference. This Haryana is water deficit state. Bihar, to some extent, is a water surplus state. And the economic conditions of the farmers there were different as the, the, the land holdings here are higher as compared to Bihar. So there were distinct differences in the uh, what we did study, what we call willingness to pay. If there is a higher willingness to pay, then that technology uh, go faster. If there is less willingness to pay, uh, then that technology, that region will not go. 
Uh, yesterday we were talking of um, ad adaptation. There are three types of adaptations. Incremental adaptation, system adaptations, and transformation adaptation. Whatever research we are doing at present in our system, the pictures that I showed, they are called incremental adaptation. These adaptations are usual even without climate change. They essentially we call it zero or no regret adaptations. Uh, they increase the productivity, whether there is a climate change or no climate change. Uh, healthy people also sometimes take vitamins, but in uh, um, those whose health has deteriorated, vitamin help more. So all these technologies, mutant uh, and therapy management, these are called uh, what you call incremental letters. This me kya hai ki income pe fark nahi padta. Income badhi hai. Cost में फर्क नहीं पड़ता है। But the second stage is such system adaptation. There is a trade-off between uh, income or benefit and the cost. Uh, when you adopt these uh, 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 technologies, your cost increases. The the income to some extent, the total income will increase. But the difference between the cost and the benefit, we call it trade-off. So there is a trade-off between uh, income and the environmental gain that we do. And the last stage is the climate-ready crops. Have you, you must have heard this climate-ready crops. There is an atlas, we call it my climate. My climate. Whatever uh, temperature is existing here, and what is expected, say, 20 years or 50 years hence, is already existing somewhere. So we can adapt to those crops which are uh, flourishing in those areas where the condition, environmental condition that we expect will take place after, say, 50 years. So this is called uh, uh, climate ready crop. Climate sensitive and uh, precision agriculture, diversification and risk management. So we are recommending by uh, rice wheat, bhot grow karli, or diversify karli ji. These are called system adaptation. But when you change from rice to sebum, the income is likely to come down unless uh, the government support at a higher level. Then there are called transformation adaptation. When the temperature uh, will suit uh, very high. Then these small adaptive, when you see in cancer, you have to go for a uh, uh, yeah, chemotherapy. <laughs> uh, in cold and cough, you can do with the smaller uh, medicines. So, suppose sea level rises, this area got inundated. So, people have to migrate. So, migrate is a transformation uh, adaptation. Suppose the temperature rises such that you cannot grow crop. Probably you will have to find some other uh, plant species which can survive in that. So, that is called transformation adaptation. Right now, uh, most of us in agriculture system are working on incremental adaptation, where you call it conservation agriculture, or you call it precision agriculture, all this is only incremental. Okay. I'll take uh, five minutes more. Then harnessing emerging science and innovations. Three uh, emerging technologies are talked about. We call nanotechnology, omic technology. Genomics is omic technology. <laughs> Information technology, geospatial technologies for genetic enhancement of plants and animals, fish, 
for higher productivity and the increased intensity of variety of laboratory stresses. So uh, this has, we have not fully exploited this power. Uh, so if we want to increase the biocapacity without reducing the population, this for research, this is the option. Productivity enhancement through new agronomy and mechanization of agriculture food system. A uh, lot of mechanization is taking place. And the mechanization, though the uh, energy consumption will increase, but the intensity of energy consumption per unit production will decrease. Then enhancing the value and safety and income through food processing. So these are three major uh, you can say approaches that are likely to be employed in uh, uh, meeting the present uh, 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 ecological footprint and the biocapacity. <coughs> Emerging potential environmentally friendly agro technologies, I mentioned plant gene technology, agri boards, precision farming, uh, farm based bio factories. We'll need only sun and sugar and some algae as a nutrient. In the lab also now, uh, in those uh, vegetable meat is being produced. So probably when our resources become limited, we will have to go <laughs> for this. Okay, a so, uh, lot of greenhouse uh, are getting established. Sure. Uh, I want to talk about the technology which is called less in our system. We call it 3D C farming. This is a new agro technology. 3D ocean farming is an antidote to land and water intensive terrestrial agriculture. See, not in the deep seas, but in the coastal areas and uh, areas uh, of sea which are uh, not very far from land, 3D farming uh, is the new option. In India, uh, because it requires a higher investment, it has not uh, come in a big way. Some small experiments from fish cases have been uh, done in CMFRI, but this has got a high potential. 3D farms are designed to address three major challenges. Increase in offshore production, because you have limited land here, to ensure food security. Transform from overfishing to restorative farming. Fishes, uh, these uh, seeds have also been over farmed. Uh, when you do it to vertical farming, uh, you will see the next picture. These are the three pictures of vertical 3D farming. This is the local system which is adopted in Bangladesh. They make a thatch, put some, uh, as you can say, paddy straw, some earth on this. This is a floating platform. Uh, you grow vegetables uh, on this. This is in the sea. See, at, in the sea at different levels, there are different temperature regimes which suit different species of fish. So they hang uh, cages vertically, and it, uh, at the top there will be algae, then there will be one kind of fish, then another kind of fish, and third kind. And they uh, uh, get nutrient from different levels. Uh, and it's a very sophisticated form is the last one. Here, no nutrient from outside is needed. Sun energy condenses uh, the uh, moisture and that moisture irrigates uh, uh, whatever is grown here and the nutrients are taken from the sea. So this has got, this is uh, advanced countries, particularly Korea, the Netherlands, they are having this sort of facility. Individual farm work will not be able to do, but big companies, uh, this particular technology will be a good one. Robot in agriculture, of course, now uh, nobody thought 10 years back that drone will be, uh, robots are also coming. 
I recently visited CIA and they are developing uh, functional roles for, uh, robots for different activities. Uh, vegetarian meat. Uh, vegetarian meat uh, is being, uh, you can say, uh, produced in factories. Artificial, uh, this is the last one so for technology concern. Artificial photosynthesis. Some of you might have heard, this is the research in pipeline. What they do in artificial photosynthesis, CO2 and water will be broken into their elemental form, CO2 and H. And then CS4 will be formed uh, using sun energy. And this will ultimately will be uh, producing artificial photosynthesis Photosynthesis process with the food is uh, the plant generate food. So this is uh, a research in pipeline in India. We have not made much headway, but some initiation in China has been made, and maybe in few years uh, this will become a, a commercially available technology. Now turning down the heat. But next, technology part is there, but then the policy comes into play. In agriculture, adaptation would continue to be the main mechanism for meeting the climate change challenge. But in place of incidental gain in greenhouse gas reduction, it will have to be more policy driven. Major policy shift is required. Water and energy pricing for agriculture leading to increased mechanization of agriculture in upstream technology. Some effort the government is already doing. Upstream technology we are subsidizing. Uh, we found that in Punjab, if, if the advanced technologies are subsidized, the reduction in electricity bill will be more than compensated by the saving in water that will be uh, resulted that will be result in water saving to take place. Policy on development and use of green uh, <clears throat> green genetic modified feed, GM crops. Uh, India is having little conservative policy uh, in this respect. Major change in land use and land rights. Policies for progression in the concept of bioindustrial watersheds. And Professor Bali used to be a very senior uh, soil water uh, conservation specialist. And he initiated this concept, concept of bioindustrial watersheds. He said that uh, in place of setting the industries closer to the towns, the in, uh, biological e-waste industries should be around the villages so that the wastage from the farm becomes a, as you can say, uh, input for those industries. And now we are talking of circular economy. About 20 years back, this concept was given by him. And at that time, he did not put, uh, he did not, uh, talk about the term of bio, uh, circular economy, but the, the implied message was that it will lead to in a, in a circular economy, biocircular economy. Uh, uh, for your information, ICR has also, no, not ICR, NAS has uh, identified biocircular economy as one of the issues for uh, this uh, roadmap development. <clears throat> Policies for propagation, of the concept of bioindustrial industrial okay. All shift is already taking place. Subsidy on upstream technologies, mainstreaming of technologies through, uh, uh, there are many schemes uh, having the type of PM Kisan, uh, RKBY, uh, PM CIS, uh, so many uh, policies are being changed. Emphasis on ICT, space technology, water advisory services, uh, this is already, uh, the government has realized that without 
uh, change in the technologies without emphasis on what you call digital technologies, uh, the uh, situation is not going to improve. My concluding remarks, biophysical adaptation are linked to increasing efficiency, land, water, energy, general and chemicals. Adaptation does not prevent all losses and damages. Even with the effective adaptation, before reaching the soft and hard limits, there will be uh, some, uh, you can say, it will not be a zero uh, carbon budget. The existing work technologies help in attaining higher productivity. <clears throat> uh, and cost of production and offer 15 to 25 percent higher income. But these there are adaptation gaps. I mentioned that uh, we have energy gaps, we have food gap, we have land gap. Then when opportunities for incremental adaptation get limited, transformative options such as changes in the land use and resource allocation will have uh, will become critical and there will always be a trade-off of income and uh, cost. Groundwater management is highly political in nature. The economists for the last 20 years are requiring the energy price to apply groundwater to the This energy benefit we worked out that even if the electricity cost is doubled, the water withdrawal will not come down because the marginal increase in productivity is much higher than the politically uh, possible increase in the uh, electricity cost. Then economic and social barriers uh, limit that technology adoption. Research, particularly gene technology, precision farming, farm-based biofactories, LED indoor crops, 3D agriculture farming, these have to be implemented. So I don't know whether uh, it was appropriate for this occasion or not, but I tried to uh, talk uh, which is being currently uh, planned. Uh, before I close, I want to thank you all uh, for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I think I have come from for the second time. And for me, the advantage is the, when I come, I see my old friends and uh, uh, <coughs> relive in the uh, past memories. Uh, I find uh, most of you are uh, those who are sitting in the chairs are new. Uh, when I was there, only I think Dr. Yadav and few more, uh, two, three persons will be there. Uh, I'm happy that uh, Mr. Siri Kivar uh, Ramaniji could come. <laughs> I always remember he was the, our senior administrative officer. And it is because of his uh, help and guidance uh, that we could uh, uh, can, uh, survive uh, that time. There were a lot of uh, issues, <laughs> administrative organizations. <laughs> Uh, Kamra is old friend in hey, uh, division. Uh, Dr. Dubey, uh, he, he's old as well as due. Now he is And uh, Dr. Ramajur could come. And uh, I'm happy that he has come. Uh, <clears throat> Rishi Sarmaji, uh, uh, he used to help me in this uh, director cell, the what you call. Uh, EMC, RME. So he is the major for me. <laughs> uh, I still remember. Uh, I know. Yes, for some time. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, uh, ICR, this Karnal uh, is mini ICR, uh, our friends from Sugarcane and uh, IRI regional station and uh, our heat directorate. Uh, incidentally, uh, when I was director, Nagarajan staff was uh, director. <laughs> we, we had good equations. So I'm very happy that all of you could come. And I thank Dr. Yadav uh, uh, for inviting me. Thank
Thank you all. And yesterday we had good interaction with our uh, chief administrative officer and other fellows. And I found that there is a positive change uh, so far as uh, uh, you can say uh, administrative knowledge and behavior towards uh, science is concerned. So that is a good sign. Thank you all. We had some problem, so I was not. Uh, <laughs> the flow was not smooth. Thank you very much, sir. Your talk was uh, absolutely appropriate, and uh, your flow was also very smooth. So. We really learned so many new things and uh, new technologies and new ideas from your talk. And just like the ecological footprints and biocapacity, I think uh, these terms are new for my scientist colleagues as are they for me. And uh, regarding the global hectare and your nine planets of, I should say, uh, environment and climate, just like the uh, universal planets. Uh, you very well said that nature knows best. And I think the points which you highlighted uh, uh, being in view of that CSSRA is certainly on that path, sir, because in terms of land use, our uh, canning term center is, I think, already going for that. And um, we are working on the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, genome editing modified crops, also new varieties. So I think uh, that uh, we will certainly follow your uh, suggested path. Uh, the only field I find new is 3DC farming. So I think we can also take up that. Our director sir is thinking that yes, because we have one fishery scientist also, so whenever he will be coming back. So this idea is really new. And uh, we really sir, appreciate your talk and your words. And I think we all should uh, give a standing ovation to uh, Dr. Tiagi for his wonderful ideas, which are certainly the need of time. Thank you. Thank you all. So, uh, so now the time has come that uh, we should present our token uh, of respect and love to our chief guest by presenting our uh, momentum. So I request our director, Dr. Apriyadu, to kindly present a momentum to Dr. N. K. Chari. धन्यवाद सर चलिए क्योंकि टाइम बहुत हो चुका है अब सभी के मन में होगा कि अब आगे क्या <laughs> अब आगे बस कार्यक्रम के अंत में मैं श्री अभिषेक जी को बुलाना चाहूंगी धन्यवाद प्रस्ताव के लिए वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल ऑफ यू Uh, respected Dr. Narendra Kumar Tyagi, uh, former director of uh, our institute and uh, former member ASRB, uh, Dr. Gyaninder Singh, uh, director IAWBR, Dr. R K Yadav, director CSSRI, Dr. P C Sharma ji, uh, former director CSSRI, uh, Dr. Yadav head uh, IRI regional station, Dr. Chabra head uh, SBI regional station, uh, Sri J K Kewal Ramani ji, former joint director NDRI. Uh, Dr. Dubbe, Dr. Ram Hazure ji, and uh, all my senior colleagues and former staff personnel of uh, CSSRI family. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today the Institute in its glorious journey is celebrating its 56th Foundation Day. And on this momentous occasion, it is my proud privilege to deliver a vote of thanks. On behalf of CSSRI and my own behalf, 
I would like to convey my sincere thanks to Honorable and most endearing Dr. N.K. Tyagi, ex-director and member ASRB. Sir, your eminent presence and inspiring words will always motivate all of us to set new examples of excellence in our services. We profusely thank you for your enlightening address. We have today with us uh, uh, Dr. P.C. Sharmaji, former director, uh, Dr. Gyaninder Singh, uh, all the heads uh, of the uh, regional stations and uh, all our senior colleagues. Uh, I sincerely thanks for giving encouragement by your gracious presence. I must express my deep gratitude to our worthy director, Dr. Uh, R.K. Yadav for guiding us in uh, all our activities and ensuring always to do the right things in the right way. It is his vision and leadership that has been driving force for us. Thank you, sir. Uh, many congratulations to all the winners. You deserve it. Uh, my special and hearty thanks to Dr. Anita Mahan, Dr. Rajkumar, Brahm Prakash, Vishal, B. Amina, Yudhvir, uh, Rajkumar Madan, Kushwant, Vinod, uh, Brajmohan Bagel, Dilip, Kuldeep, and all the wonderful people of Team CSSRI for their valuable support, dedication, and untiring efforts. You all worked smilingly, shoulder to shoulder, to make this event success. At the end, I once again thank Dr. N.K. Tyagi, ex-director and member SRB, and the distinguished assemblage for your august presence on this historic occasion. We are really honored. Thank you all, Jahin. Thank you, Abhishek Ji, for thanking us also, including everyone. Uh, so next will be that we all will be standing for national anthem. But before that, I shall announce that we all will assemble for a group photograph just in front of the building before moving forward for the high school. So now this is time for national anthem. the <laughs> I think we can move for the group photo and then we will die our time. We can move for the group photo and then we will die our time.